Hey everybody, welcome to The Geek Generation. I'm your host, Rob Logan. And on this episode, I have two interviews for you with two wonderful voice actors. First up is a phone interview with Kari Walgren, who you might know from projects such as FLCL, Rick and Morty, Kung Fu Panda Legends of Awesomeness, and many, many more things. Then, immediately following that, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Julie Nathanson in person at San Diego Comic-Con. You might know Julie from projects such as Avengers Assemble, Far Cry 5, Suicide Squad Hell to Pay, and much more. Speaking of San Diego Comic-Con, we are uploading all of our interviews from the convention to our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to at thegeekgeneration.com slash YouTube. We'll also be releasing another podcast episode that includes all of those interviews in audio format for those who prefer their content that way. So make sure you subscribe to the Geek Generation podcast on whatever podcast player you prefer. So let's start things off with my interview with Kari Walgren. Uh, how are you? How was your day? Uh, it's been great so far. Just had a, a session uh, a little bit ago, and then now I'm home doing this. That actually brings me up. You said you were recording today, and that kind of leads into one of the first things that I wanted to talk about, because I'm super curious what the day of a voice actor looks like. Well, the first thing is that no day ever looks the same as the next. Um, usually there is some sort of auditioning. Um, usually, you know, you get auditions from your agent. So you are finding some time during the day to record those. You could have anywhere from one to five sessions. So, you know, sometimes there's a lot of driving around and going to different studios. Sometimes during the week, you'll have regular projects that record like Wednesday afternoons, you may record this particular show. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes, you know, you've got a regular gig, but then other times, you know, you're just recording something new. Uh, so you're constantly kind of in that audition mode and in that meeting new people and having to kind of prove yourself again mm -hmm. mode. And sometimes you'll be going to out of house places for callbacks. And then, you know, sprinkle in that if you're doing any, any on camera or any other types of projects, then you have to sort of figure out how to schedule all that into the rest of your day as well. So it's, it's a, uh, it's a uh, hustle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how difficult is it to change gears from one project to another? It can be a little tricky, but as long as they have saved a voice reference for you, that's a huge help. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, because if people tell me, can you remember what you did? three weeks ago, I can't remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> so uh, it's always good if they say, Oh, here, we've got a little recording sample of what you did at the last session. And then that kind of clicks you right back into that character. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so going back to like early in your career, at what point did you realize that the characters that you were looking at on screen had like actual human beings behind those voices that are performing those characters? You know, it's funny, but I had a sense of that from a very early age. Uh, I apparently told my parents when I was a little girl, I'm going to be the voice of a Disney cartoon. So I, I had a sense very early on that someone was behind the voices and I would run around the house acting them out. And uh, so I've always kind of had, uh, had a desire to do voiceover as part of my career. And I did a lot of stage work. I did, uh, you know, a lot of musical theater and and then as I got older, I, I did commercials and, you know, did some on-camera things. And, but I've always wanted voiceover to be part of it. So when I moved to Los Angeles, I was still auditioning for everything. But the voiceover side of it just really took off in a way that I didn't expect. And that has kind of become the majority of, of what I do now. Hmm. And was that something that you just kind of leaned into because it became more prominent? You know, I had a little phase after moving to Los Angeles and I had gone on a number of on-camera auditions and everything. And I, I just kind of 
wasn't enjoying it as much. And I just wasn't really liking how the world, the on-camera world worked very much. So I was like, you know, I'm going to take a little break from that. I'm going to focus my energy on the voiceover side of things and see what happens. And it just kind of took off. So, yeah, I think part of it's that I put more energy and focus into the voiceover side and and it took off. And so I've got to keep that going. But I also, I just love it. I really Mm. enjoy it so much more than anything else that I do. What is it about voice acting that's so special for you? I think, I think it's because there are no limits. I'm not limited by age. I'm not limited by gender. I'm not limited by <laughs> being an earthling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just play so many characters in voiceover that I would not get to play in animation. Mm. Uh, I mean, in uh, on camera. So, you know, I'll have a, a typical day where I'm playing a grandma and a little boy and a princess and a baby all in the same day. Mm-hmm. And I just, I love that because on camera, you're, you're so much more limited by what you look like and, and you know, what your, what your age is and, and that sort of thing. And I just feel like with voiceover, it's, it's so much more wide open. In that, in that kind of vein, is there, because you said you like kind of the range of it, is there a character that you've played that kind of sticks out in your brain as something that was so far from your physical self or personality wise, it was just like way out there and it was like a great challenge. (laughs) Uh, I think I remember the very first audition I got for a baby and I was like, I can't do a baby. It sounds, you know, a baby noises. I don't know how to do that. (laughs) So you just kind of experiment and play. A lot of the best things happen just from messing around, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, so I went home and I just started making noises and just sort of experimenting and stuff like that. And I came up with something that I was like, oh, that kind of sounds a little bit more like a baby. So I did that audition and I didn't get that role, but my agent liked it enough that they sent me more baby <laughs> parts. <laughs> and so uh, when I started booking babies, that was like one of those wow, I can't believe this is now something that I do. (laughs) And when people need a baby, I'm one of the people that they think of. They're like, oh, Kari Walgren can do that. So it's pretty cool. You know, I've I've played babies now on multiple projects and uh, I've done a lot of them on Doc McStuffins and Henry Huggle Monster and uh, various shows like that. And it's just one of those things that I had no idea when that first audition came through, that it would be something that would become such a part of my, my life. <laughs> That's so funny. Now you're the baby lady <laughs> is the baby lady. <laughs> does, does that happen often where you do something well, and then that's a thing that you keep getting asked back for? Yeah. You know, it, it, it does happen that way. Um, because a lot of times, especially with, with TV animation, they have to cast so quickly. Mm. So if, if the people know, oh, you know, Kari can do this, uh, or we only have one contract and we need somebody that can do three different things, you get kind of that reputation. Um, <laughs> kind of jumping back to your, to your move to LA, at what point in your career did you decide to make the move out there? I know you grew up in Kansas. I did. I grew up in Kansas and uh, I was working professionally in Kansas city. And I, I was getting a lot of work there. Uh, and I had a a few people in Kansas city say, you know, you really should think about moving to New York or LA while you're still kind of over 18 to play younger. And, you know, you look young and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a big gamble because I, I turned down a number of jobs in Kansas city to make the move to LA. Hmm. And it definitely felt like the wrong decision for, for a chunk of time because, you know, I, I came out here with no contacts and, uh, you know, I left behind work and, and it was, it was a real grind for a while out here in LA, but it was definitely what I wanted to ultimately do. You know, I Hmm. wanted to be able to, 
to, to work in this market. And, uh, I feel very lucky that I've been able to do that. At what point did things turn around for you then, uh, when you were in LA? I would say uh, when I booked the role of Haruko in FLCL, that was my first anime job. And that was, that was within the first, I think maybe two years of moving to LA. Oh, wow. And I didn't realize at the time what a huge, uh, effect that would have on my, my career. Uh, we've just now, you know, 17 years later or, or something like that, we've r- recorded sequels for it for Adult Swim and Cartoon Network. So, so I think within the first few years, I had my first little tiny breaks of, of success. But, you know, it definitely took longer than that for it to be a full-time job. Yeah. In those, in those first few years when you were in Los Angeles, what kind of kept pushing you forward? Was it just chasing the dream? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when people ask me about it, you just, you have to really love the process. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to enjoy auditioning because that never goes away. I mean, I still audition pretty much every day. So if you don't like auditioning or you don't like the journey of it, uh, this may not be the right business for you because it is a journey. Mm. And, you know, there's so many factors that are out of your control. You can't determine whether or not, oh, they're going to cast a celebrity in this role or, oh, you sound too much like somebody else that they already cast. Like you can only just go and give the best audition that you can. And then you just have to sort of let it go. So I always tell people, you've got to really enjoy the process and you've got to really form a life outside of, of the pursuit, if that makes any sense. Like, absolutely, yeah. you've got to, you have to be happy and find a fulfilling life while you're hustling and, you know, finding, uh, auditions and, and, and kind of going through that grind. Because if you're just unhappy every moment of the day, it, it affects your work. It's yeah. that weird catch 22, you know? So I guess those would be a couple of pieces of advice I would have for you. What are those, what are those outside things? Do you have creative projects on your own or do you try and find ways to kind of like cut back from the work and have downtime? That's a great question. For me, it goes in spurts. Like sometimes, um, sometimes I'll go through spurts where when I was younger, I used to watch cartoons for relaxation. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. But I've had periods of time now where I'm like, you know, I can't really watch cartoons the same way because mm. I recognize people's voices and it makes me think about work. So that may not be the way I want to unwind during certain periods of time. Sure. Uh, you know, for me, my friends are really, really important and spending time with them is important to me. I love to read. I love listening to music. Um, In the last few years, I've really started to to enjoy going to uh, music concerts. And uh, so, so then, you know, if I get creatively inspired to do other things, like I wrote a short horror film and produced that, and that was really fun. And, you know, now I'm working on a concert. So, so creatively, Sometimes if I take a step back, then it fuels other areas to, to kind of artistically create things. Do you feel like that's a necessity for like the modern artists? Because everyone's like a hyphen now. We're like, I do this and I do yeah. this and I do this. <laughs> like It's so true, you know, and it's not like you have to be. But um, I think keeping that sense of curiosity and exploration is is good. It's not like you... You know, maybe you play the banjo and you don't play the banjo well, but it really, really makes you happy and fuels your soul. That's going to make you a better artist, Mm -hmm. even if you're not a great banjo player. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think finding whatever feeds you can only help you with your with your performing. When you're uh, when you're auditioning for a new character, what do you look for for influences? I imagine you don't always get an image of them to see. You know, you use whatever clues you are given. Uh, if you're given a picture of the character, you use that. If you're given a script, uh, you take whatever clues you can find from the script about the character. If it's based on source material, you know, like a comic book or something like mm-hmm. that, you can sometimes go and, and uh, look at that or 
uh, you know, sometimes they're, they're based on little shorts that are on online. Uh, so you just kind of use whatever, whatever uh, clues and, and source material you can to kind of create the character. And, and if you don't have any of that, then you create it in your imagination and you, you put forth your best effort and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've talked to some voice actors that have said that some of their favorite voices to do are just bad impressions of celebrities. Is, is that the case for any of yours? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I've created, definitely created characters of me trying to do an impression of, usually it's a, a guy. So my my take on it as a female ends up turning into something completely different. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, oh, that's interesting. It's fun. <laughs> Uh, those old cartoons that you mentioned growing up on that you watched for relaxing purposes and whatnot, what were some of the biggest ones that kind of influenced you and made you want to work towards being a voice actor? Well, I definitely drank the Disney princess Kool-Aid yeah. as a little girl. I loved the Disney uh, movies. And uh, then when I got a little older, Batman the Animated Series was a huge influence on me. That was, that was definitely... Um, one of the the primary things that made me think, man, I've got to do voice acting as as at least part of my career. Mm. Uh, that was just such a game changer. Yeah, Batman the Animated Series is one of my favorite shows ever. Uh, and I got to, uh, in San Diego just recently, I got to be in the room with the cast and producers because they were promoting the Blu-ray release. Nice. And I, have you had the opportunity to work with anyone from that show that was just like, oh my God, I'm working with people from Batman? You know, I've gotten to work with Bruce Tim and James Tucker and, you know, the guys that uh, that worked on that show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've worked with Mark Hamill a number of times and he's awesome. And so. So, yeah, I've worked with a lot of the people that that uh, were on that show. The cool thing is that at Comic-Con, this this one that just happened mm -hmm. last month, uh, I met Kevin Conroy for the very first time. No way. Really? And. I am not even kidding. I had never met him before. And um, a couple of my friends were talking with him and just kind of flagged him over. And we all took a picture together. And I was just fangirling inside so hard because he was such an inspiration to me. So that was a really awesome moment. <laughs> okay, so, so since you're on the other side of the curtain already and you see the production side, do you still like geek out and like when you hear him it's like oh my god bruce wayne is talking to me right now oh my gosh yes uh there have been numerous moments um the first time that i did a session with frank welker who is the voice of scooby-doo and um fred and curious george i mean when you hear when you're in the booth with him and you hear him start doing those iconic voices you just melt into this little seven-year-old in the booth. Mm. I, I mean, it's just magical. So yeah, I've, I've definitely had a few experiences like that where I just, you know, turned into complete mush inside hearing <laughs> these voices that I had grown up with. Have you had any memorable experiences where you get that now where a fan comes up to you and you do a voice and you just watch their reaction? Yeah. You know, I'm starting to have that more and more. Uh, it, it's so weird. I'm starting to get the whole you were the voice of my childhood. Yeah, uh, a lot more at conventions, and I, I think, man, I, I, I don't feel that old. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't feel like the voice of someone's childhood. But, but I'm starting to get that more, and it's, it's such a privilege, uh, because now when I realize what it has meant to me to have these other people influence me, I, I kind of take it a lot more not seriously, but, but I take it as a lot more of an honor when people come up to me and, and, you know, I'll do a voice and it will affect them and they'll say what it meant to them. It's mm -hmm. just truly to be part of someone's past like that and be part of their lives in a way that's meant something to them is, is really special. It feels like a superpower. Like when I've seen it happen to other people, like there's, there's some wave that comes through someone when they hear that voice in front of them. Yeah, it's it's crazy and it's it's so special. Um it, it kind of knocks me out every time. Yeah. 
Now, when you record, I imagine you've worked in both solo situations and uh, when you have a group of voice actors with you. And I've seen uh, I've seen what that group looks like and that dynamic. And it looks like <laughs> an insane amount of fun. Chaos. It oh. looks like chaos. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like the best like working situation ever. It's It's so fantastic. I mean, it's the funny thing is that you usually get your sessions done a lot faster when you record alone mm-hmm. because they're, everybody's just joking around and doing funny voices and, and you spend so much time as a group cracking each other up that it, it usually takes twice as long to record everything. Yeah. Yeah. But it's awesome. There's nothing, nothing like it. Yeah. Yeah. And you've done uh, tons of animation, obviously, but you've also done a bunch of video games. How do you find those processes differing from each other? Yeah, video games are uh, they're they're very technical, and uh, if if you're doing a game like Final Fantasy or something like that, where it's being uh, uh, not necessarily dubbed over to English, but it's already been created in Japan and. Mm-hmm. So now they're they're doing it for the American audience. A lot of times you have to be really meticulous about the timing. Mm. Like it literally comes down to, okay, Kari, you've got 1.4 seconds to say this line. So I'll say the line and they'll say, okay, we came in at 1.8 seconds. Can you tighten it up? Oh my goodness. Okay. Now we're at 1.6 seconds, just like a little faster. Wow. So it can be very, very uh, meticulous work. Um, and also it, it can be very strenuous because you're doing pages and pages of damage efforts and dying efforts. And so, you know, you're, you're literally being beaten up and killed off for about 10 pages. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a different, it's a different kind of recording than, than a Disney show or something like that. What uh, precautions then do you take to protect your voice? Like, what do you do to maintain the instrument? Uh, well, you definitely learn to work from your diaphragm a lot, and you learn voice placement. If you scream and you place it in a certain part of your chest and voice, it hurts a lot less than if you put it in another place. I mean, I, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but um, I definitely recommend voice lessons and singing training mm-hmm. uh, for anybody that wants to go into voiceover. Not because you have to be a great singer, although that can help, you know, there's singing on certain jobs, sure. but it also just kind of teaches you about vocal placement and it can open up a whole new world to you as far as, oh, you know, I can make different sounds if I put it more up in this part of my soft palate and, you know, oh, it hurts less if I, you know, put this into my head voice. Mm. So it, it's, it's interesting, you know, your voice is an instrument and the more you can learn to use that instrument, the, the more, uh, it helps you out in a VO career. Does, does that, I assume that it comes into play too, when you're, uh, constructing those new character voices. And then do you learn like, oh, if I move my voice over here a little bit, I'm going to get this slightly different sound that works better for this character. Or? Absolutely. I, I think you, you just, you discover things through play and experimentation which is why you can't take yourself too seriously in voiceover because you just have to constantly be, you know, messing around and and trying to make new funny voices and noises. Yeah. Just to see what you can do. When you audition then, do they give you a few opportunities to try a few different things or do you you feel like you're really kind of just gambling and I'm going to do this one thing and hopefully it works for them? Well, you can do more than one interpretation of a character but you should really, my advice is to really make sure that that is motivated by the character. Okay. Uh, don't just put on a funny voice to show them that you can do three different things. Mm. If you do three different takes of a character, there should be a very specific reason. Okay. I usually don't do more than two different takes on a character. You know, if I do a third choice, it is because I really have three specific different things that I could see that character being. Oh, well, I, I said I was going to let you out of here early and then I got lost in the conversation because <laughs> I was enjoying that so much. 
Um, That's good. I'm, I'm glad. Hopefully it was interesting. <laughs> oh, this was wonderful. I had a blast talking to you. Um, I do want to make sure I give you an opportunity to not only talk about maybe any upcoming projects you have. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I have a few things that I'm just about ready to be able to announce and I can't yet. <laughs> okay. So uh, I, I'm definitely encouraging any voiceover fans out there uh, to follow me on social media. Um, I'm on Twitter at Kari Walgren and I'm on Instagram at Kari underline Walgren. And that's spelled K-A-R-I-W-A-H-L-G-R-E-N. Uh, and then I also have a Facebook page. So, so very, very soon I'm going to be able to announce some really exciting stuff that is just blowing my mind right now. Uh, aside from that, uh, the new third season of FLCL is going to be coming out in the first few days of September on Adult Swim and Cartoon Network. And we have episodes of Boss Baby and Trolls, The Beat Goes On, on Netflix. And um, OKKO, OK Let's Be Heroes on uh, Cartoon Network. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to the upcoming projects. And this was an absolute delight. Thank you for taking the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Kari. Yeah. Take care. Have a great day. Thank you, too. I'm here with Julie Nathanson, and uh, we're talking about all sorts of things right now. Uh, we're at San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, you, I've, I looked at all the things you've worked on. <laughs> it's an exhaustive list. Um, but you started out before getting into voice acting. You started on on screen things. Yes. Um, when did acting even kind of dawn on you as a thing of like, okay, because not a lot of people go, hey, I can do that. That's a possibility. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a really um, uh, an academic family. Mm -hmm. um, so there was always a stress on academics and making sure that you have your education in gear. But when I expressed interest in uh, the entertainment field, nobody batted an eye. So I was really lucky that that was encouraged or at least allowed to be, yeah. you know, to sort of blossom or whatever. Um, but in terms of the very first time I discovered performance, I was six years old and we put on a little play. I think it was in first grade. Yeah. And uh, it was the first time I was on a stage and you know, I could peek behind the curtain and I saw you know, my parents in the little folding chairs in the audience. And I was really excited and I remember all of that. And, uh, and right before the curtain actually went up, um, we found out that the kid who was in the first skit wasn't there. So I ran backstage put on his like weatherman's you know, jacket and, mm -hmm. and put my hair in a low ponytail so I thought I would look like a boy. And I ran out and I did his scene. Because apparently in my enthusiasm, I had memorized the entire thing. Everyone's parts. So, <laughs> and I do, I, I do have like a weird memory for certain things, but this was a little bit like for six years old to remember yeah, this other kid's lines and nobody asked me. We didn't have understudies in first grade. Um, but that was it. I think I, I think that was sort of the first clue that it was something that I really loved and I continued to be in plays and, yeah. you know, went to camp and tried to star in all the plays and then went to performance art camps and then started moving into, um, more serious training as I got older yeah. and singing training in, in, in addition to that. So it just sort of grew out of passion. You know, I'm mm. a big believer that curiosity breeds aptitude. Yes. So if there's something you're really interested in doing, if you put your study and, and mind into it, then it becomes something you gain skills in doing. Mm. I, I have trouble with the educational modality that includes this kind of uber traditional sense of like everybody standardized, everybody learn all the same I'm things. I'm a teacher, so I get it. Yeah, okay, I so am, I'm, yeah. I'm completely preaching to the yeah, actual yeah. choir. Yeah. So there, there's something really beautiful about cultivating whatever, you know, sort of breathes life into our passion and letting that galvanize yes. learning. Absolutely agree. 100% yeah. <laughs> agree. Um, so then you, you start doing on screen work yeah. and then uh, very early on the voice stuff yeah. started coming in. Yeah. How did that become aware to you? And was that a decision to actively lean into or was it more falling into it? Uh, it was both. So I started out on camera. I started out in soap operas. Mm -hmm. uh, wait, way back in the day when we still had soap operas and we had these things you could watch during the day. Yeah, there's not now, a lot no, now you have to watch the news because you have to make sure things aren't going to blow up. 
Um, but in uh, back in the day, we did soaps, and it was before anybody told us, don't read the comments. So I was like, I'm going to read the comments. I want to see what the fans think of me. That sounds like a great idea. It was a terrible <laughs> idea. So, um, <laughs> so I looked, and someone had said, she, and I quote, she's real pretty and all, but I have to turn off the volume because it's like Alvin and the chipmunks have invaded my living room. Wow. And I went, huh, first of all, screw you. Second of all, I'm going to go make money on that. That sounds like a career. Yes. That sounds great. So I, I, at the time, was represented at the same agency where I am now, which is CESD Talent. I was there for on-camera commercials. And I said, hey, guys, I'm trained as like an opera singer. I've been you know, trained and acting my entire life. Let's see if I can do this voiceover thing, mm. right? So the voiceover department said they'd try me out. I went on my first audition, which was for Lifetime Television, for promos. Mm. And I had to say, the dish, the wire, Pandora, three blind dates, the place on Lifetime, come as you are. And I got the job. There's that memory, by the <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, the memory's right there. Uh, I also know the first 60 digits of pi, so like don't, it's weird. Um, so <laughs> it's really <laughs> weird. Passion breeds aptitude and trivia. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, this ended up being a job that worked every week mm. for, and it paid my rent for a year and I loved it, not just the financial piece, but like it was a really lovely fit for me. Yeah. And um, I, I balanced uh, on camera and voiceover for a few years. And then I got the opportunity to write on an NBC show. I was uh, staffed on a show called Just Deal. And when that happened, I really had to make a decision because writing was starting to take off and voiceover was already in place. I was very lucky. I was doing on camera. It sounds like I made a deal with the devil. I know I'm lucky, very grateful. Um, but it, I let go of on camera and it didn't hurt me. Mm. I didn't miss it. And I think part of that for me is that, you know, so much time spent people looking at me and saying, I know exactly what you can do, right? I don't, I don't yeah. like that idea. There's so much more internally, right? Talk about don't judge a book by its cover. On-camera acting is the ultimate, right? At least professionally, I think, sure, speaking, absolutely. right? Yeah. And I know what you can do. I know what I'm going to believe that you can do based on what you look like. So based on what other people seem to think I look like, I did a lot of like, oh, I'm sorry, I spilled that on myself. Oops, I forgot my brain. And like, that's kind of not where I come from. Mm. And, and it's fine, it's a color, but it's not all of the colors. Sure. So with voiceover, I get to do anything. Yeah. You know, I can play a giant creature, I can play a tiny blob of goo, I can play like, you know, anything. Anything. Well, I did a terrible imitation of James Earl Jones at a um, panel yesterday telling a really mortifying story. <laughs> and, um, and, and at the end, the moderator was like, I actually think that was the worst James Earl Jones I've ever heard. And I was like, thank you so much. I, I agree with you. But yeah, and yet I've heard people say that <laughs> even their bad impressions are a voice that they can use somewhere. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. I mean, it's all play. Yeah. You know, I mean, again, talk about education. That's all play-based learning Absolutely. anyway. Right? Yeah. yeah. So On that's that note of kind of playing anything. Uh, is there a role that kind of jumps to mind for you that's maybe the farthest away from you, either physically or personality-wise? Well, um, the first one that jumps to mind for me is uh, Samantha Maxis, because I played um, Samantha Maxis in Call of Duty Black Ops, The Resurrection, okay. uh, sort of the zombie moon map stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't really think of myself as an eight-year-old undead. So that was pretty far. Um, but I've played some like crazy creatures. Um, I, like I've played Quaggins in Guild Wars 2. Mm. I don't really think I'm very much like Silver Banshee. <laughs> and I, I do play her for DC, um, Warner Brothers. And um, you know, the, the, the darker, more villainous characters, I feel like, are a little farther mm. from my actual core. You do know? you feel like you get those more? Because I've noticed that Sometimes the nicest people play the most <laughs> vile characters. Yeah, like we, it has to be diametrically opposed. We were talking about that on a panel just a couple days ago that there is something. First of all, I like to live in the light and play in the dark. Mm. Right? So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm happiest like connecting with people and finding empathy and compassion and trying to sort of breed kindness in the world. Right? Mm -hmm. But I also like to play in the dark. I'm not immune to the fun of going to the dark side. Mm -hmm. I just don't want that to be what I do to others. Right? Sure. So, so that's again, part of 
the ridiculous fun of being an actor. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes the nice people get to be really mean. <laughs> but I do, I do play a lot of nice characters. I play, I play the glitter genie on Shimmer and Shine. <laughs> it doesn't get a lot nicer than that. The glitter genie, she can make anything out of glitter. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but like on uh, Marvel Avengers Assemble, mm -hmm. you know, I play Yelena Belova. I play uh, Crimson, Crimson Widow. Widow. Yeah. So, you know, and she says, uh, what does she say? Das Vidanya Avengers. Like, she's much darker. She's dark. And she wants to kill you. <laughs> Hell Hydra. And you also, uh, you've done voices for TV, for films, yeah. for video games. Yep. Video games and series feel very different like uh, video games are exhausting are they not <laughs> well to record yeah. to play um i think it depends on the game the the uh, for me the core of what i do stays the same mm -hmm. but the process is different and the okay. process for me has a lot to do with how much research i get to do so with a video game we will i will never read an entire script for a video game that's yeah. not a, i don't think that's a possibility right but for film and TV, I read the whole script. I have beginning, middle, and end. I know the arc of my character. Mm -hmm. I know all the little secrets that I need to know to bring little twists and turns to what's happening mm -hmm. in my lines. And I know the relationships around me. Okay. When I walk into a video game session, I would say at least nine times out of 10, and that's being generous. Yeah. I have never seen the script before. Wow. And it is an exercise in cold reading walk in and like, all right, here's what we're doing today. Okay, it looks like we're going to the swamp and we're killing some lizards. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to rely on, and it's a trust game, the developers and the um, voice director to give me enough context so that I can try to do what I'm hired to do, mm. right? So part yeah. of my job is to be able to be quick on my feet for Absolutely. all of us yeah. when, we, when we do this stuff. Um, but the game stuff, you know, it's, it's tiring physically when we're doing combat work. Oh yeah, because sure. it, and it's not. I mean, obviously, doing motion capture and performance capture is different, but sure, sure. doing efforts in the booth. I mean, I am like I'm throwing punches. I'm doing, you know, I'm blocking stuff as I'm doing the efforts. <gasps> yeah. <gasps> it's the only thing that makes it believable. Yeah. People know if your body's moving. Oh or yeah. Not. Well, I can tell. Yeah. Right. And it's about me. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> uh, aside from getting the feedback from the director, yeah. um, when you are crafting a voice for a new character, what do you go on for that? I mean, you have the script. I'm assuming you don't always get to see what that character is going to look right. like. Right. So wh where do you build that? Um, so if it's something I've had time to, uh, the ability to research, time is, I'll, I'll make the time to research if there's information out there. So if it's a character, for example, um, like Silver Banshee, I researched all of the iterations of Silver Banshee. Um, there have not been a ton, mm -hmm. um, but I went to the first in the 90s and then I looked at all the renderings from then until today. I checked out what happened on Supergirl. I was aware of what happened in the comics. Sure. So I could have enough information to build what I wanted to know as her backstory um, and get that sort of harsh, edgy, there's always a look to her. I mean, mm -hmm. she looks like she's chiseled out of stone or like she's an actual knife. I don't know. There's something yeah, yeah. so deliciously, truly edgy about her. And so I wanted to ground her in that. Okay. Um, and then, you know, finding something. I would say like the way I build a character is knowledge first, empathy second. Mm -hmm. If I do those right, then the voice print comes naturally and that's third. Okay. So once I feel like I understand the character mm -hmm. and I get where she's coming from and I can make it really true and really believable for me, then the voice print usually just falls out of my face. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, for people that are looking to get into voice acting, um, I, I mean, I've looked into it for a while. I know uh, I was speaking to some people from a uh, television cast yesterday that were mm -hmm. like, I've been trying forever to yeah. get into voice acting yeah. and I'm getting plenty of on-screen work, but that's something I want to do. Mm -hmm. Where would you kind of direct people towards for that? Well, there, I have two different answers. So for people who already have a background in acting, mm -hmm. who understand you know, wh what that is, how to approach um, a script, how to understand a character, how to put yourself into it, modulate whatever it is you're doing based on um, what's happening in your environment. All of those things are, are um, part and parcel to learning the trade, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the craft of acting. Sure. So for those who are already professionals, I would say 
you know, go ahead and take a, a class in voiceover, learn a little bit more about how that process works, mm -hmm. learn more about mic technique, learn more about, um, you know, whatever, I guess, like genres and trends and things that you would want to know if you're doing commercial stuff, promo stuff, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, the more narrative work. Um, and then, you know, there's vocal training that can happen as well. That's sure. kind of like the, it's like taking the master's already, you ha getting a master's degree after you already have your undergrad. Mm -hmm. If you've never done any acting, you have to start out with the undergrad, yeah, right? You can absolutely. move to the master's later. There's something really inherently um, tr true about voice acting mm -hmm. that the myths don't touch, right? The myth is, um, hey, I've got like a really cool voice, so like I would want to do voiceover because people say like I sound really awesome. Yeah, yeah. And you do. You sound super great, and that's an awesome voice. You have to learn how to actually embody a character with that voice and then find your versatility, find sure. all the different colors that you can paint with that voice and with so many other parts of your personality and vocal cords. So starting with acting training, then moving into, you know, again, vocal training, voiceover understanding. Mm -hmm. um, D. Bradley Baker, who is yes. a legend, um, made a wonderful website called IWantToBeAVoiceActor.com. A lot yeah, of those questions fantastic. are answered there, mm -hmm. and we all like to direct our... Uh, our aspiring voice actors to that site. He made it a lot easier for us because we all always want to say the same things. Get this kind of training, get that kind of training, yep. read this book. And he's like, got it. Go to this place. Yep. Smart move. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I feel like we could do this all day. Well, we but, could. Uh, <laughs> we could. Okay. I'm, I'm not moving from this spot. <laughs> oh, okay. You can leave. I'm keeping your microphone. Oh, sure. I will be here all day. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks for being here with us. This has been The Geek Generation. That's kind of the perfect way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm just gone. Yep. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having Thanks again to both Kari Walgren and Julie Nathanson for joining me. You can see everything else that we do over at thegeekgeneration.com. If you use iTunes, please rate the show and write a review. We always appreciate those. You can watch our live events at twitch.tv slash thegeekgeneration and follow my personal Twitch account at twitch.tv slash therobloganton. You can send emails to podcast at thegeekgeneration.com. And as always, the show theme is provided by Machine Supremacy. A link to their site can also be found on our site. We'll be back soon with more geeky stuff for you, and we'll see you then. Later. Make it so.